Amen. Thank you, Brother Brian, for that song. How many of y'all believe he's coming again? Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, I'll give you the chapter here in just a second. And uh, before we do the scripture reading this evening, I ask for your help. We're going to do a little participation uh, exercise illustration tonight. And so I ask that you would uh, please listen to this. Not hard. Everybody can pass. Everybody can be a winner this evening. And I ask that you would please kindly participate. Use your uh, Holy Ghost given imagination on this. Uh, before I go any farther, Pastor, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to preach tonight. I do not take it lightly. And it's uh, so wonderful to be able to preach. So thank you so much. I hope you have a, a wonderful time while you're away at the Joy class. Uh, so, what we're going to do this evening, um, I like to ask everyone to bow their head and close their eyes. And we're not going to, we're not to have an invitation right now. Don't think, oh, yes, he's letting us out one minute into the sermon. Amen. Uh, I want everyone to bow their head and close their eyes. And so what I want you to do is if your birthday is in a certain month, and I'm going to say it here in a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand and open your eyes and look around the room. And you got to pretend that the only people you can see are those that are standing. Okay? Everybody understand? So... Right now, if your birthday is between January or March, so January, February, March, if your birthday lands in that month, I ask that you please open your eyes and stand and look around the room. Okay? Now, the only people that are standing are the ones that you can see. Pretend that no one else, you, no one else is here except those that are standing. I want you to notice who is here, and I want you to notice who is not standing with you. Who is not standing with you. Okay? So those are the only ones that are here. All right, you got them in your mind? Think about someone who's not here. Keep that in your mind. You may be seated, bow your head, and close your eyes again, okay? Simple, simple. See, everybody, you're doing great. Fabulous job. Now, if your birthday uh, is in April, May, or June, please stand and open your eyes and look around. All right, the only people that you can see are those that are standing. You can't see anybody else. I want you to think long and hard about who you can see and who you cannot see. Who can you not see? Remember at least one person of who you cannot see right now. That would be someone that would be sitting down. All right? Thank you. You may be seated. You may bow your head and close your eyes again. All right, if your birthday's in July, August, or September, would you please stand? Look around. Those that you are standing. Oh, there's less than not, not many summer uh, third quarter birthdays. Uh, so those that are standing, you can see. If you can't see, if they're not standing, you cannot see them. All right, you got it? All right, sit down and bow your head and close your eyes. Lastly... Uh, fourth quarter birthdays, October, November, December. If you would, please stand. Open your eyes. Look around. Those that are standing are those that you can see. If they are not standing, you cannot see them. They are not with you in your group. So take a mental picture of someone who is not standing that you cannot see. Okay? You may sit, sit down. And uh, everybody can open their eyes back up. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And this will all come into play later on the message, but I want you to see that and think about that. Now, do you have someone in your mind that you couldn't see? Some of you had your spouses stood with you. Uh, you had the same birthday in the same few months. And uh, it was pretty even. The summer months were a little bit light, but approximately, you know, one, one fourth of the crowd stood in each, in each group. And, but surely there was people that you saw and that you loved that were not standing when you stood, when you stood, Okay. And uh, we've been singing about the rapture this evening, about uh, seeing the Lord, what a glorious day it's going to be. And I want you to think about this. If the rapture happened right now, right now, the Bible says in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and it's all going to happen. Now, the illustrations, I'll go ahead and just tell you with you now so you can be thinking about it. When you stood, you were the ones who were left behind. You were the ones who did not go up in the rapture. And so when you saw someone, well, when you couldn't see someone in your imagination, those people left and you were left behind. And I, and I was thinking this week, what would life be like post-rapture? I know what it's going to be like for me because I know I'm saved. But then I thought about those who are lost and how horrible their life's going to be. And 
you know, there's a lost and dying world out there who doesn't know anything about what we're going to be preaching on tonight and what pastor's been preaching on and what this church stands on. They, they, don't know, they don't know what's to come. If you've been coming to this church any amount of time, you know what's ahead. You know what's coming. And then I think of the people in here tonight who may be a professor but not a possessor of Jesus Christ. Man, you got everybody fooled. You got your spouse fooled. You got your kids fooled. You got everybody fooled. But down deep in your heart, you know you're not saved. You might be here tonight and you're not fooling anybody. You know. You say, yeah, I, I know I'm not saved. And then to know that either you're a professor and not a possessor, you really don't have it. Or you just flat out admit that, yeah, I'm lost. To think of what is church going to be like the first Sunday after the rapture. I mean, it's one thing if you're ignorant, you don't know anything about what's going on. But to sit here in these pews and to know the truth and to ignore it and to reject it week in and week out, you show up to church, you might be standing here with those few that stood up when you stood up with your group. You want to talk about a horrible feeling. To think that I missed the opportunity. I knew the truth and I sat back there and I did nothing about it. You want to talk about scary. It's going to be talk about torment and pain and anguish knowing had I just come to the altar one more time. Had I come to the altar and gotten my heart right with Jesus Christ. I wouldn't be here with the loss of you. Now do I believe every single person in this room saved? No way. Do I believe every person who comes here every Sunday morning, Wednesday night, is saved? No. There's people here tonight who are lost. And if the rapture happened tonight, you'd be left behind. You'd be left behind. And that scares me to death. We've been singing about Jesus is coming soon. He's coming again. And what a glorious, wonderful day that would be. But do we really believe it? And I believe if we lived it and walked it every day of our lives, our lives would be different. Amen. We would live a completely different life. Right. And so this evening, I want to speak to you on this thought. When God's clock strikes 12. You know, we, we preach that. Um, I've heard it many times. I believe we're at 1159 on God's clock. And I believe it. Amen. Yeah. Do you all believe it? Well, I believe it too, but I don't live it every single day like I do. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul is writing here to the church at Thessalonica, giving them, trying to give them some comfort and encouragement about their loved ones who have passed away and gone on uh, to be with the Lord. They were, they were concerned about their future and their hope. And he says in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means asleep, those that are dead in Christ. Um, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord should not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you to bless the reading of your word tonight. Um, thank you, Father, so much that it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, you know the thought that you've laid upon my heart, Lord, in the message. Father, I can only do what you've told me to do. And sweet Holy Spirit, right now, I'd ask you to move upon the heart of every single person that is here this evening. Lord, you know exactly who in this room is lost and who is one of yours. Father, I pray right now that you would draw those that are lost Sweet Holy Spirit, please convict them. Convict them in ways that they've never been convicted before. Father, I pray that you would make the rapture seem so real to them tonight. Lord, that no one would leave here lost. Lord, they would come to this old-fashioned altar, God, and they would get saved tonight, Lord, before it's eternally too late. Lord, we all believe you're coming soon. And I pray you'd help us, Lord, to uh, take the thought of this message, Lord, and apply it to our life. Help us now, Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So the thought tonight is when God's clock strikes 12. We all believe we're at 1159, 59. You can look at what's going on in Israel. You can see what's happening in the world. And, and we're getting closer, amen. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. But yet, do we think, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of us thought, today's the day the Lord's going to come back. I believe he's coming back today. Did, I was curious thinking in your heart, did, did, did you think that? I thought about it because I was studying for the message. But it, it, day in and day out, money through during the middle of the week, do I wake up in the morning and say, today could be the day. I'm living in expectation, earnest expectation that today my Redeemer draweth nigh. He's, he's coming back today. Do I live that way? Do you live that way? But what if it happened today? Some people want to deny the fact that the rapture is going to exist. But first of all, I want to tell you, number one, the reality of the rapture. The reality of the rapture. You know, there's so many false doctrines out there in the world. Some people confuse and, and believe so many different things. But I can tell you tonight, the rapture is going to happen. Amen. There is nothing left to happen before the rapture occurs. There's no more prophecy left to be fulfilled. There's nothing left to occur except for the Lord uh, to have that shout, the trumpet to sound, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be at the Lord. There's nothing to prevent that from happening right now. Amen. Nothing. Right. Nothing. Right. Nothing. It is going to happen. Look what it says in verse 17. It says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Now, the word rapture, if you go home and try to study it, you're not going to find it in your Bible, okay? Now, that doesn't mean we're teaching false doctrine here because you can't find the word in the Bible. The word, you see the phrase caught up, underline that there in your Bible in verse 17. Uh, that phrase caught up comes from the Greek word harpezo, harpezo. And in Latin, harpezo is translated raptus, raptus. And that is where we get our word rapture from, okay? So caught up, that phrase is the definition for harpezos or raptus, which is where we get our word rapture. So right there it is, okay? That's where it is, right there. And there's, you know what, uh, some people want to uh, claim, say, oh, the rapture is not going to happen until after the end of the, rep at the, end of the tribulation period. That's called um, a post-tribulation raptures, praise God, I'm not one of those, amen. There's some who say, oh, well, you're going to have to go through three and a half years of the tribulation, and then that's, then that's when the uh, rapture's going to happen. That's a mid-tribulation raptures. Praise God, I'm not one of them, amen. But then there is the pre-tribulation raptures, which is what I believe the Bible teaches plain and clearly. And that is where the saved in Christ are going to leave this world before one second of the tribulation happens, Amen. A pre-tribulation rapture, and that's what we are, because you know what the Bible says, we are not appointed unto wrath. And you can see that in the next chapter over in verse 6, it says, therefore let us not sleep as do others. Uh, but let's see, nope, here it is, um, wrong verse, verse 9, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. The wrath of God is going to be poured out in all of the tribulation. And I'm glad I'm not going to have to experience the wrath of God. God's chastisement is enough for me, amen. And I don't, even, I don't like it. I'm glad he does it because he loves me. But I don't like it when he disciplines me. It hurts. It's painful. And you have not seen anything like the wrath of God. And if you're here tonight without Christ, the wrath of God abideth on you because you are not one of his children and you have the rapture, you have the, the tribulation coming your way if you don't get saved. The, there is the reality of the rapture. It is going to happen. You say, why, uh, why will the rapture take place? Well, the rapture is going to happen because there is the completeness of the bride. The church is complete. As the church, we are the bride of Christ. Christ is the bridegroom. And you know what? He's saying there's one more person in here or in this world that's left to be saved. But once my bride is complete, it's all done. It's all over with, amen? The, the family, the church, the bride is complete. And then the father's going to turn to the son and say, it's time. Come up hither. It's going to be ready. And we're gone, y'all. We're gone, amen. And it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. You can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. And if it's going to happen, it ought to change the way we live our lives. And if you're lost, 
you ought to get saved while you can. It's going to happen. So we can see why is it going to happen there? Because there is the completeness of the bride of the church. And you know what? It's also going to lead into the commencement of the 70th week of Daniel. Now, I don't know at what point, how soon the tribulation is going to happen after the rapture. But after the rapture has gone, the Holy Spirit, he is left with us. And then it's game on. The, the tribulation will start soon thereafter. And then it's going to be horrible. God's wrath is going to be poured out upon this earth. On this earth. So we see when the rapture will take place is going to happen before the tribulation. But we see why it's going to happen because the completeness of the bride of Christ. Are you a part of the bride of Christ tonight? Are you one of his? Just because you believe in God don't mean you're saved. The devil and the, and the demons believe in God. I believe the rocks believe in God because the, the word of God says, if we did not praise him, the rocks would cry out. They know who he is. Just because you come to this church doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Just because you're some, a member of some denomination or you, you've done this or if you've done that doesn't mean you're going to heaven. So many people are wrapped up in everything else. Because my grandpa Blake was a preacher don't mean I'm going to heaven. I've heard that one before. The only reason you're going to go to heaven is because you've recognized yourself a sinner. You've recognized your, that you cannot save yourself. That no matter how much good you've done, you cannot save yourself. And then you say, I believe Jesus Christ gave his life for me. He paid it all. He took my place, and I'm going to place my faith in him alone for salvation. That's how a person's saved. Yet sadly, there are millions of people all around this world trying some harder, complicated, messed up way to get to heaven. Where it's nothing but by grace through faith are you saved. So we see that, number one, the reality of the rapture. It's going to happen. It's not just some fairy tale, fictitious thing. It's right there in black and white. We, we, we just read it. Verse 17. It's also going to be, we're going to see it in, in 1 Corinthians and in Revelation as well. So we, first of all, the reality of the rapture. We see when it's going to take place, why it's going to take place, but also... The watching for the rapture. You know, the early church lived in constant expectation of the rapture. I mean, you know, Christ ascends into heaven. Then the angels come back and they say, you know, the same, the same Jesus who you saw ascend to heaven, he's coming back. And you know what? They thought he'd come back the next day. They didn't know how long he was going to be gone. But you know what? They believed that he could come back at any moment, any moment, any moment. And you know what? That caused them to be um, earnest about serving the Lord because they, they believed his word. They believed that he said that he was coming back. And they said, we need to be watching for his return. Look what the Bible says. I'll read these verses to you real quick. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, it says, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch... And be sober. You know what? I went out deer hunting yesterday, and I actually didn't take a nap yesterday morning. I stayed awake the whole time in the tree stand. But you know what? If I do not stay awake, if I am not watching, something could happen. Something could come by my way, and I could miss out on it. Well, you know what? When it comes to our spiritual life, and we're not watching, we can miss out on it. I'm not saying you're going to miss the rapture. You're going to miss the rapture if you're saved because you're not watching. But he's saying we should be watching because it could happen any moment. If I think that big buck is down there in the woods and I can hear something, I, I hear the rustling, I hear the heavy breathing, I say, there's something down there. There's something coming my way. I can look in this world and I can see things, I can hear things and know something's about to happen. It's not time to sit back and sleep and wonder, well, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. It's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. We need to be watching for his return. Not only in 1 Thessalonians are we supposed to watch. In Titus 2, it tells us, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to be looking for that blessed hope. We shouldn't be looking out at everybody else. We should be looking towards our blessed hope because when we look to him, we're going to find joy. We're going to find peace. We're going to find contentment and happiness. We're going to find the help and the strength that we need through all the troubles and the trials of this world. That all happens when we look for our blessed hope. 
Stop looking in everybody else. Stop looking in the politicians. Stop looking in your family and friends and start looking for him. Amen. 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 Or just be looking for that blessed hope. But we also need to be knowing the time in Romans 13, 11. It says, and that, knowing the time. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. That was the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome. Christ had not been gone that long. And he said, Christ is nearer than when we believed. That's been thousands of years ago. And Paul was saying that then. How much more closer are we to it now? What I, I believe the problem is, we all said earlier, yeah, he's coming again. We said, oh, yes, I believe he's coming again. But we don't believe he's going to come today. We believe he's going to come. I remember um, when I was younger, I said, Mom, what do you think the rapture is going to happen? She's like, oh, I believe it will happen in your lifetime. And I believe it's going to happen in my lifetime. But you know what? My lifetime, it could be long. I hope it's long. Or it could be short. But we believe it's going to happen someday. But I really, it's probably not going to happen today. Why? Because we've become, I believe, cold and indifferent. And like, he hasn't come for 2,000 years. So what's another day? What's another day? I mean, yeah, I know I'm supposed to love people. I know I'm supposed to tell others about Christ. But what's another day? Is it, is it really going to happen today? Nah, probably not. I thought that yesterday and he didn't come. So, you know, he, he, he's probably not coming today. I, I believe he's coming today. But, but yeah, down deep, I really don't think he's coming today. That's where I believe the vast majority of Christians live. Be honest with you. That's where I live. I'll be straight with you. Because if every single person in this room alone lived their life as if Christ could come back one minute from now, every single one of us in this room, lives would be different. We'd be doing different things. We'd be more concerned about different things. Our entire priorities in life would be completely different. Now, I'm not saying, oh yeah, quit your job tomorrow and go do this and go do that. No, we got to be responsible but you know what? I guarantee a bunch of you work with a lost sinners, a bunch of lost sinners every single day that need Jesus. Yeah. Are you witnessing to them? Amen. I bet everybody in here has got a lost family member. Are you sharing the gospel with them? Do we believe he's coming or is he not? Do we not? So we see the imminency of his return. They knew he was coming. But you know what happened? Instead of us watching and looking and knowing that he's coming back, we watch everything else. We watch Facebook. I'm, about, I'm going to duck here in a second. Oh, we watch a lot of TV. The YouTube, man, we, woo, got to love that YouTube. We got, got our nose in that. We're in the Twitter. We're in the Internet. We're into gossiping. We're into responding what um, everybody else does and says and not showing love to one another and compassion to fellow Christians and, and the lost that are all around us. We're caught up and wrapped up in everything else other than that the Lord could come back today. Amen. Amen. How much of Christ do people see in you every single day? Do you look like everybody else? Do you talk like everybody else? Do you act like everybody else? Do you go to all the places like everybody else does? Do you comment on all the stuff on Facebook that everybody else comments about? Will we all just be quiet about it? If we truly believed that he was coming today, our lives would be different. There is an imminency of his return. Do you truly believe the return of Christ in the rapture is imminent? I don't know if you do or not. He's coming. So we, first of all, we've seen the reality of the rapture. Secondly, the results of the rapture. And I'll hurry. Verse 16b. It says, um, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The results of the rapture, first of all, 
is we can see that the raising of the dead. Now, their souls are already in heaven, amen, but this is the physical resurrection of their body. And you know what? And then it goes, says, then we which are alive and remain, verse 17, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. You know what? Their bodies and their souls are going to be reunited there and there. And what a glorious thing it's going to be of our loved ones who've gone on to be with the Lord. They're going to get reunited. They're coming back with the Lord. Their bodies are coming with in the air. And then it says, then we which are alive and remain are going to be Caught up with them, amen. And we're going to have a, <coughs> excuse me, a glad reunion with them, with our loved ones. But you know what? That's not the best part. I look forward to seeing my loved ones. You know what we're going to see next? Our Lord. You know what? He is the focus of the entire rapture. Everything's about Jesus, amen. It's all about him. Laura, Miss Laura sang about it tonight. The choir sang about it. what a When I see the risen lamb, I'll cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy is the lamb of God. That's going to be the best part, amen. It's we're going to be have this glad reunion day with our Savior. But then we see as a result of the rapture, if you're saved tonight, it's going to be great. It's going to be <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be an out of this world experience. <laughs> Catch that? But sadly, not only is there a raising of the dead and there's a reunion, but there's a remainder that's left behind. And I don't know who here tonight has rejected Jesus Christ time and time again. I don't know who here is a professor and not a possessor of Jesus Christ. Only you and God know that. And sadly, so many people let pride keep them from coming to the altar. They let what their family might say or think about them about coming to the altar. Maybe you're here and you, we've had several uh, people in our church who, who said they made a profession of faith when they were a child, but then they realized later in life that it wasn't genuine, it wasn't real, and they were baptized, serving members in our church, and they said, I need to be saved. They, they humbled themselves and they came and prayed. You know what? Not a single person laughed at them, scorned them, said, Oh, my, can you believe that? They've been lost this whole time. If you said that, you need to repent and get on the altar yourself. But you know what we said? We said, glory, hallelujah. Somebody else got saved. But Satan will put all those things in our mind and tell us that's the reason why we should not be saved. Why we can wait, why we can put it off. But are you going to be one of the remainders left behind? You know what's going to happen in the tribulation. You know what's coming your way. And I mentioned, what will the first Sunday be like at Taze Valley Baptist Church be like post-rapture? Well, I can tell you. It's going to be dead. Will there be some people show up? Yep. Because I believe a lot of people are going to know something's happened. And I'm going to go find out what happened. But you know what? There's going to be no one here to preach. And you can say, go, you can pull up on YouTube and you can try to play all a pastor's sermons and he can preach from heaven via YouTube. But you know what? It's probably not going to do you any good. You've missed your chance. Your chance has come and gone. Why are you waiting? Are you going to be the remainder left behind as we did in our illustration at the start of the message tonight? Are you going to be one of those few left behind? That means if you're left behind and your family has gone, There's not going to be no glad reunion in the sky. There's not going to be a wonderful time with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have nothing but, most likely, but hell and torment and the lake of fire to look forward to. Now, there's a slim chance you might get saved in in the tribulation period if you live that long. But the vast majority of the earth, a lot of the earth, is going to be destroyed and killed. Who's going to say, oh, yeah, I'm I'm going to make it through that. Why chance it? Get saved today. Why well, say, you know what, I'm going to gamble with eternity, and I think I, my odds are good. I would say your odds of winning the lottery are better than your odds of surviving the tribulation and making it through. We see the reality of the rapture, the results of the rapture. Will you or your family be left behind? Quickly, thirdly, we see the rejoice in the rapture. Rejoice in the rapture. Look at the latter parts of uh, 17. And it says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know what? There's going to be a continuation with our Lord and Savior 
post-rapture. We're never going to have to come back and deal with the problems and the issues of this world. We're not going to deal with pain and heartache. We're going to be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life and shed all of his blood on the cross for us. We're going to be with him for all of eternity. Amen. Amen. It's not just for a little while we're going to go visit him, then we're going to come back here. No, we are with him forever, and we should be able to rejoice in that tonight, that we are going to be with him forever. The one who's loved us greater than anyone else could ever love us. The one who gave his life for us and saw fit to love old wicked sinners like you and I. We are going to be with him forever, amen. In verse 18, we see the comfort in the rapture. He says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know what? We might be worried about our loved ones, but friend, don't worry about it. You might be scared and questioning and wondering what's going on in this world and saying, how am I going to make it? How am I going to survive? Well, we, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior tonight, there's comfort right here. There's comfort in the Word of God. There's comfort in these verses. And we should draw from that comfort. And when someone's discouraged and downhearted, we should be able to show them comfort from the Word of God that, hey, we're going to win. Our time is not long here on earth, so let's serve Him and love Him every moment that we can. So we see the reality of the rapture, the results of the rapture, the rejoicing in the rapture, and lastly, the response to the rapture. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The response to the rapture. I'll read this quickly, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. Listen to this in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. Amen. We just read that. Remember back in 1 Thessalonians 4. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption. And this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. In the Lord. What must we do? The response to the rapture. Point four is in verse 58. We must be steadfast, unmovable. If our faith is in something other than Jesus Christ, we're going to be shakable. We're going to be movable. As the, the winds and the waves and the turbulence of this world goes, so are we going to go with it. But as born again believers, we must remain steadfast saying i am sticking with this stuff i don't care what some other church does or what our program is going on i'm sticking with the bible i'm sticking with the lord and i'm going to stay faithful till the end Amen. we got to remain steadfast unmovable that means i ain't budging i'm sticking with what god says I, I don't care what the world says, what the politicians tell me i got to believe and can't say and can't do. God says I'm supposed to proclaim the gospel. I'm going to do it. Amen. But he says, continue working, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. If we truly believe that the rapture is going to happen, there's a response that every born-again believer in here should have tonight. And that's that I'm going to tell somebody about it. Amen. I'm going to tell my family about it. I'm going to tell my coworkers about it. I'm going to tell everybody I can every single day because his return is imminent. What's your response to the rapture? If you're here tonight and you're lost, your response should be, I'm coming to that altar right now before the invitation even starts and I'm getting saved. I'm not going to wait. I don't, it doesn't matter if you're a uh, professing uh, church member, but you're, you know down deep you really don't have it. Come up here right now. Let's get it taken care of. Don't wait. I don't, we don't have to play no music or nothing. You can come up right now. You can get saved. But if you're here tonight and you say, no, nah, I'm not a professor. I know that I ain't got him. I know, I'm also, I know if the rapture happened right now, I would be left behind. I would be one of the, the few to come to church here at Taze Valley Baptist that first Sunday after the rapture, and I'd be scared to death. You ought to come to the altar right now and you ought to get saved. What are you waiting on? You wait and say, I think I can make it another day. Remember the point earlier on that the, the return of Christ is imminent? 
there's nothing left that could happen. He could happen right now. If he could happen right now, you need to get your heart and your life right. I wonder how many Christians tonight are not living where they need to live tonight with Christ. You say, oh, yes, I believe he's coming back. But you don't live it like it every single day. Every single person in this room, I believe we all have areas of improvement that need to happen in our Christian walk. I believe it's high time for us to start living our Christian lives like his return is imminent. If you do, you're going to see a massive change in your life and in your family's life. And you know what? It could result in people getting saved. Do you believe? I'm almost done. I'm going to ask you all over here. Get down here on our level. Do you believe his return is imminent? That it could happen tonight? Do you really believe it? you got to answer that in your heart. You all over here. I'm looking at you. Do you really believe deep down in your soul that he could come tonight, that his return is imminent? Do you believe it? Do you believe his return is imminent? Do, do, you, do you really believe it or like, yeah, I believe it's going to happen, but it's not, it's, it's not, it's not going to happen tonight, Brother Sean. I'm going to go home and watch Sunday night football. I don't even know who's playing. Uh, what, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about what's going to happen at work tomorrow? Or do you truly believe he's coming? Like, and it's like soon. It could like happen now. Do you truly believe it? It doesn't matter if it doesn't happen now, if it doesn't happen until next week. We have to live every moment of our life as if it could happen today. You all, do you truly believe that could happen any moment? Deep down in your heart, do you believe that it could happen right now? Only you can answer that. Everyone, please bow their head and close their eyes. I wonder how many feet people need to come to the altar right now. And need to do business with the Lord. I wonder how many tonight can slip with their hand and say, Pastor Green, if I died tonight, I am not 100% sure that I'd be on my way to heaven. And I'd like you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand? Slip it up. Not for sure that heaven would be your home. Would you please slip it up? I'm not going to embarrass you. Slip it up high until I can see you. Anybody like that at all? Not for sure. Or you know for a fact that you're not on your way to heaven. Would you slip your hand? Anybody like that? I wonder how many Christians tonight say, Preacher, I need to do a better job of living my life as if he could come back at any moment. Would you please pray for me? Would you slip your hand? Anybody like that? Thank you. I see those hands all across the house. Why, as we stand, I'm going to invite you to come up and pray right now. Why don't you come up and pray? You slip up your hand and say, I need to do a better job of living like he's coming back today. Maybe you got a family member or a loved one who's lost. Are you really burdened for him? If you are, won't you come up and pray for us? So Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Oh, God, thank you so much that you're coming back soon. Father, I pray you'd help each one of us, dear God, to live our lives in light of your imminent return. Be with those here who are lost, God. Maybe those who didn't even raise their hand. Sweet Holy Spirit, I pray you convict them. And Father, draw them now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Won't you come?